Yeah, so what I'm, I'm gonna do today is um, kind of present a, a sample of the work I've been doing um, in the context of a book I'm editing on the Nile Delta and also in the context of my upcoming book. And I, I, I wanna propose a reflection starting from two examples that also um, uh, is tied to, uh, let's say a process of learning and unlearning I've been doing in that relationship to um, questions of indigeneity and my place as a settler on this land and also my place as a settler here who's working uh, on, on a foreign land. So let's see uh, how it's gonna play out. Um, so as a starter in lieu of a, um, of a proper, well, of a land acknowledgement, I thought I would let um, indigenous Torontonian uh, share a bit uh, about the history of the place I am in and most of you are in right now. Uh, and also about its name, uh, where it's coming from, and what are all the entanglements of this name. Boris, can you do a thumbs up to make sure you hear the, the music, the sound? Ani, bonjour. Sarah Rock and Dishnikaz. Shebananing and Donjaba, Takaranto and Dai. Takaranto, a Mohawk word, the place in the water where the trees are standing, the place where the fish weirs are. My dog and I spend a lot of time walking. It's my favorite way to move through this city. For me, it's a meditative action that isn't about negotiating bike lanes or public transit, but a time to slow down and really try to see the world around me concrete sidewalks, parking lots, now covering the rivers and trails that once flowed freely. The Patun, the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabek, the Métis, the Mississaugas all made their homes here. And many other nations expanding beyond these groups traveled through for commerce and trade for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. I think of the other first people's languages and the names they had for this place. I think of the ancient trails covered by the pressures of settlement. The waterways and the moderate climate of the Great Lakes made it a perfect place to fish, hunt, grow food, gather medicines and seeds for horticultural development. Rich, fertile and abundant, Turtle Islands, Mesopotamia. Many first peoples and their goods traveled from here all the way to the Mississippi and back. Whenever I travel somewhere new, I try to find out whose land I'm on, and I ask, who are the original occupants here? So for Indigenous peoples, land acknowledgements are not only to assert our sovereignty and treaty rights of today, but it's also a way for all peoples to feel more connected to a place. Davenport might be a street now when I walk down regularly in my neighborhood, but it's not just another thoroughfare. For me, it's an ancient portage trail that holds indigenous knowledge. They say the animals made the first trails that led them to water and the people followed. I imagine the deer and the moose once made this trail, followed by the people carrying their birch bark canoes, carrying their goods to trade and bringing stories to tell. Nations from all over Turtle Island met and traveled through this land. Many languages were spoken. Alliances and decisions were made. People from different nations met and intermarried. The Dish with One Spoon Treaty was made. Takaranto was a meeting place and land made up of sophisticated and cosmopolitan peoples and cultures that I see reflected in the city today. I wonder, is it something in the land and the water? Land acknowledgements might seem like a small and simple gesture, but like many of our ways, they are intended to have more impact and hold more meaning than the words alone. If we pride ourselves on diversity and equality, shouldn't our story include Indigenous peoples? In this era of reconciliation, we need to share the truth first. And reimagine the narrative of this land and this city together. Thank 
Okay. So as a way to, uh, to introduce the topic, I thought uh, after uh, this introduction, which is really about the, um, the place we are in and what the, the, name, the name bears, uh, I thought I would share a uh, story that has to do with the name of a place, which is actually my family name. Um, so I come from a, a lineage of settlers from France who arrived here um, in the mid 17th century. So the first Blouin called Best Blouin, uh, his first name was Emery and in other documents, Médéry or Médéric, uh, came here from uh, Etusson, which is in, um, in Western France uh, in 1664. Uh, so we have documents that give us a general trajectory of his migration and of his life. And he settled, um, at the Ile d'Orléans, which was already renamed with a French toponym, uh, which is right next to Quebec City. Uh, he settled and he got a grant of land from the Jesuit uh, in the village of Saint-Jean, Ile d'Orléans. And as a matter of fact, my family is still there. My, summer used, my father used to spend the summer at a farm there and he's still uh, selling apples at the market in Quebec City every fall with his cousin who still has a apple uh, farm on the island. So we've, we've, I say we people with the Blue Eye family name have very uh, ancient roots as far as North American settler history is concerned uh, on the continent. Now let's uh, fast forward to uh, the 20th century. At some point this fall, I don't remember for how this happened, but I realized that there was a lake in Abitibi-Témiscamingue, this region uh, where the, the red dot is, that was called Lac Blouin. And so I, I, I was curious as to where the, the name come from, given I'm interested in question of toponymy. And lo and behold, I realized that this name was actually given on top, so as a way to erase uh, Anishinaabemowin, so indigenous name, which was uh, Lac Pakitanica. Uh, literally, this means goose's lake. Um, in French, we find it as Lac aux Oies or Lac aux Outardes. Uh, so the story be behind this renaming, oh, that's another name for the, the lake, <clears throat> and that uh, kind of colloquial name, uh, Sand Lake, because as you can see, there are, there are beaches. Uh, the story behind the grant of this name is uh, really tied to the movement of colonization in this particular region in the early 20th century. So Abitibi Temiskamen got literally colonized uh, in a context of development of mines, of mining industry, and also uh, forestry uh, at that time. And so one of the surveyors who worked for the Ministry of Forests and um, mines of Quebec was called Alphonse Blois and came uh, from the area of Quebec City. So it is in his honor <laughs> that the, the lake was renamed in 1968. So, so we have here really a case where um, an agent of settler colonialism and occupation is um, kind of immortalized in the landscape through a toponym that erases completely uh, the indigenous name of the place, which came with a very different uh, baggage. So this is the type of question I wanna explore today, uh, but focusing on what I'm working on as a scholar, which is uh, ancient Egypt, Hellenistic and Roman Egypt. Um, so the situation in Egypt is very, from the data we have for the Hellenistic and Roman period was, was quite different than the situation where here now in Canada, as far as toponyms are concerned. So as you can see, both for Quebec and for Canada right now, uh, about 10% of the all known toponyms are indigenous. Okay, so that means there were a lot of foundations, obviously, but we can also assume that a, a hell of a lot of indigenous toponyms uh, are not, were, were replaced. Uh, whether they are still in use, by indigenous communities in, is another story, right? And this is something I'm also going to discuss in, in my talk with regards to the, the, the examples I want to I, I, I want to talk to you about. So, so in the case of 
this very different context, which is Hellenistic and Roman Egypt, um, which is still a context where you have an indigenous population who's ruled by a foreign power with uh, a certain amount of settlers, not in the same proportion. You kind of have a very different uh, toponymic picture from the data at our disposal. So as an example here, um, these are the proportions in uh, the Mendesian norm, which is the region I've been studying uh, for the past uh, 15 years. Uh, so that's from my book. As you can see, of all the toponyms we have from this uh, district, uh, about 92% are Egyptian. And the Greek ones are generally translation, kind of Greek adaptation of, of Egyptian names. So a very different, a very different uh, picture here. Um, so the, the broader question I want to ask today is, what does it mean to name and rename a place and a space? Um, I want to show you two examples. Um, so the, what we call the Nile Delta and what we call Alexandria. And Anas will also help me. Uh, we're going to do this in the long durée and multilingual uh, fashion going from Theronic data to medieval data. Um, a little word on my approach and how my particular research uh, is positions with regards to questions of indigeneity. So there is a, a brand new uh, issue of the journal La English Language Notes, which tackles the recent interest of medieval studies colleagues uh, for questions of indigeneity. And so this is something that's a bit in line of, you know, my, my own interests and that of others recently. And uh, the, one of the editors of the journal, Taryn Andrews, um, puts forward a, a way of proceeding and an approach which she thinks is constructive. And so the way she sees it, and, and I'm trying to, to kind of take that in when I, when I think about my indigenous learning and my research uh, is the following. So this begins with the difficult work of reflection and self-examination that aims to consider the limitations of Euro-American epistemologies and how to overcome them. It's about thinking deeply about how exclusionary our tradition of scholarship and methodologies can be, how we can learn from our feeling, uh, failings and uh, find ourselves accountable to the futures we want to imagine. Um, and so she urges us to do the internal work, not with the expectation of being patted in the back, but rather with a good heart. So this is kind of the way in which um, I approach my current work, which as Boris says, it, it's a work in progress. It's a work in progress. So let's start with uh, Tamahu, which is uh, the Nile Delta, as we know it. Um, so there are two, so I've done an analysis of all the uh, toponymic evidence regarding how this area that we call the Nile Delta was called in antiquity all the way to the medieval period. So I'm gonna really synthesize the, the evidence here. If you're interested, I have a, it's gonna be a chapter in my edited volume on the Delta. So I have a, a, quite a long article on the matter. So this is a, a synthesis. So there are two, two traditions, the Egyptian tradition on the left, in the left column and the Greek tradition. In Egyptian, um, the Delta was called Tamahu. Literally, we can translate it literally as Lower Egypt or the Northern Land. Uh, this toponym is attested as early as the Old Kingdom, which is, let's say, the time of the pyramids. Um, and it is most probably related to Tamehti, which means north or northern land. Um, so the Egyptians orientated themselves facing south. South was kind of our north, if you want. And it makes sense because this is where the Nile had its sources. And in text, they conceptualize the south and the sources as the head and the north, the delta with its extensive papyrus marshes as the end, uh, the tail or the bum, if you want. And so that also follows obviously the topographical slope of 
uh, the, the, the river basin, which is going more and more down. Delta offers us, obviously, a very different perspective. Um, the first mention and attestations, plural, of Delta are found in Herodotus, as all of you might know. Uh, Herodotus, I, if I remember correctly, it's 12 mentions of Delta. <clears throat> the first one is in 213. And so he talks about the Egyptians who dwell lower. So kind of interesting when we know the Egyptian word used for the region, then the Lake Moiris, which is the Fayum, and uh, chiefly those who inhabit what is called the Delta. So he's already telling us that the region was already named, like it was not a novelty uh, in his lifetime. And a little later, he mentions that this toponym comes from the Ionians. So in today's uh, Turkey. So these are the two traditions. Now, what, what was happening on the ground? How, how did people in the region call, call it? And was it different than what we find in literary evidence, most of which come from outsiders? Um, so I did, I did a bit of quantitative data. So this is the stat. Stat and chart time, a lot of fun. Uh, so I did compile all the attestations of toponyms that refer to the, de to the delta in its different variation. As they are compiled in one of my favorite nerdy website on earth, Trismegistos. Let's all save Trismegistos. So there, there's a total of 186 attestations. Now, right off the bat, yes, this is not perfect. So there are no data in Coptic, neither are the data in Arabic in it. And a lot of hieroglyphic texts are not there. However, it's doing a pretty good job with Greek and Latin uh, papyri and other documents. Um, so let's take it as a sample and as, as a starting point to, that can provide us some trends. I think, I think it can. So a total of 186 uh, mentions of the different names uh, or variations of Tamahu in the different stage of the Egyptian language and of Delta as well, uh, and of Tamahu in Greek, Latin, and also Aramaic. So as you can see, most of, the, of them are documentary evidence. And... Um, Sorry, I'm putting you in mosaic, but then I cannot see my screen. Okay. <laughs> and then um, almost 49% uh, of the data of the overall total are written in one of the Egyptian scripts. So hieroglyphic, hieratic, um, and Coptic, and demotic as well. Uh, not Coptic, sorry, Coptic is not there. So hieroglyphic, hieratic, or, or demotic. Now, if we only look at the documentary sources where we find a toponym that designates the delta, um, the proportion of toponyms in Egyptian, it's much higher. It's 72% of all the data. Um, the vast majority of the attestations can be linked to the Egyptian toponymic tradition. So about a quarter only are linked, uh, are, are instances of Delta. Um, now, another interesting point I wanna, I wanna share with you today is that the, the Greeks and then uh, Latin uh, speakers translated Tamahu. Um, so we have, we have two expressions, Katochora, Kora being literally the, the translation of ta, which is land in Egyptian, and kato egyptos, uh, so literally lower Egypt. Uh, so the lower land and lower Egypt. Um, these uh, are a bit, in, in literary sources, we don't find them as often as delta. So delta is really kind of the, the word in literary evidence. And this is really the one that we've absorbed very, uh, very quickly in modern uh, languages because of this imprint of, you see, of, of uh, Greek and Latin literature on our un collective understanding of the Mediterranean. Um, so, 
So in Greek and Latin, we find two variations on tamahu. So I obviously ask myself, what is the difference? Why do we have two different uh, traditions? Um, so some observation. Cato Egyptos and Egyptos inferior is not attested in papyrus inscription from Egypt, which surely may, makes sense. Like you don't need to say you're in Egypt, you're there. So it makes more sense that people would use Katokora, which is uh, the literal translation of the Egyptian. Um, on the right hand side in blue, I'm, uh, I'm circling the literary data. So the literary mentions of uh, Kato, um, Kato Egyptos are not that numerous, as you can see. Uh, we have one mention in Strabo uh, and one in Pliny the Elder, but otherwise everything else is much later, 5th to 16th century. In other words, it doesn't seem that either this was an interesting uh, expression for them to use. They had delta uh, in uh, earlier period, uh, or it, it, it kind of got, uh, it, it, they were writing about topics that didn't really um, ask of them to use this expression. Interestingly, Pliny the Elder tells us that Kora uh, was the word used in, uh, by the people of Egypt to refer to uh, the region. So really what we are in the presence of here, I suggest is an endonym, uh, which is a local translation of the Egyptian toponym, which made total sense <laughs> because of the environment of the region. And then an exonym uh, that was adopted by writers who wrote from a non-Egyptian perspective, that is, they were not based in Egypt and they were not writing for an Egyptian audience either. So last point, uh, Delta in papyri. Um, so as you can see, we don't have many attestation of Delta in all the Petrological corpus, an epigraphical one too, by the way. We have nine uh, total from a much more condensed um, chronological window. So what I, I realized while doing this, uh, this research is that actually Delta means several things. And both um, literary sources and pep papyri show that um, there was a conception whereby Lower Egypt had more than one deltas. You have a passage in Strabo that mentions that delta was the name of a village, of a district, and of all of Lower Egypt. I'm really condensing here. I'm happy to expand in the q &A. Then uh, one of the authors I'm a huge fan of, Ptolemy the Geographer, uh, really uh, underappreciated in my opinion. Egypt-based um, scholar also describes three deltas, uh, the great, the small, and the third. Um, what is interesting is that he not only tells us which branches of the Nile kind of are the limits of each delta, but, but the way he describes them, these delta also shows that Delta kind of applied both to the, um, the splitting point of two branches, just like the apex and smaller apexes, if you want, and the, uh, the whole region. So this is a completely different kind of understanding of the territory, which from an Egyptian point of view makes sense, right? The, the, the reverse splits up and it, it forms different uh, kind of semi-triangle. And you have a similar, though a bit different, description of several deltas in another author uh, who's also Egyptian, as in he's from Egypt, Achilles Tatius. Nicosetinas wrote a very compelling article about that. So, so delta, in other words, seem to have designated different regions, also different points, different apex. And it was also used to uh, designate a settlement, most probably as pretty much all settlement by the Nile with a harbor at the apex. Um, maybe 
in the area of the island of El Warat now, which is north of Cairo, uh, a district which might be actually a, another name to the Areopolitan known. Uh, I can expand on that as well in the Q&A and uh, all the Delta. So we have here a um, attestation of the use of Delta in Egypt, but a, a much more complex one that is much more in tune with the reality on the ground and with how uh, Greek speaking communities and Latin speaking communities kind of absorbed that, right? And, and, and made, made it something that made sense for them in their language. And so starting from these literary evidence, if you look at the papyri, most of the mentions actually fit with uh, a settlement more than with the whole of the Delta. It doesn't make any sense to think that they designate the, the whole Delta in the, most of the papyri. Okay, so, so that's for the toponymy of Delta and Tamahu. Uh, as far as, let's say, late antiquity goes. And now Anas has done uh, quite a bit of work on what, was the what is the situation in Arabic sources. And so he's gonna uh, give you a little summary of his findings. Yes, uh, I will start with the awkward part when I ask you if you see my screen. How old clear? Oh, okay, perfect. Uh, so the Modern Arabic word for uh, the Delta today is surprise, El Delta. Uh, Dr. Blois uh, was curious about when did Arabs uh, adopt this Greek term, and uh, she sent me on a quest in Arabic sources. So I methodologically opted with uh, doing two separate inquiries. Uh, one yeah, on Islamic maps and uh, geographers, and the second on literary uh, sources, mostly travelers and historians. Uh, what you have before you is the Al Khawarizmi map, it's the oldest uh, Islamic map of the Nile. Uh, there is no delta here, Iskenderia, uh, the Kor Kora here, and there is also no separation uh, between the high and low Egypt. Uh, what you see here is a separation by climates. And this is because this is a scientific map inspired from Ptolemy's work, and uh, it is more, more scientific than it is a map of Egypt. It's more a map of the Nile. Uh, second map here I have is from Ibn al hawqal and uh, he's uh, um, uh, one of the greatest Arab geographers. And what's interesting is he does the division. Uh, yes, the maps are upside down because that's the Arabic tradition. So you have here uh, Nawahi Mesr, which is the regions of Egypt, and you have here uh, uh, Said Mesr, which is the high highland, higher, uh, higher and upper Egypt. So uh, this is uh, this is not uh, purely uh, geograph uh, geographers uh, uh, terminology because we find it also uh, in um, uh, literary sources. For example, Ibn Battuta, the North African explorer, uses uh, the exactly Said Mr. Al Ala uses the exact term. Uh, so what's important here is that we see that uh, there is uh, uh, the traditional uh, indigenous Egyptian tradition of dividing between the two lands that uh, continues. Uh, in the Arab period, and the word delta is nowhere to be found. Let's continue with another map. This is another great uh, Arab geographer. He's uh, Al Igrisi. He was born in Morocco, but he moved to the service of Regis II uh, in Christian Sicily. And uh, what he does is he also uh, differentiate between uh, the two lands, and uh, he has. Uh, Asafil Ard Misr and um, uh, Ali Ard Misr, the highland of Egypt and the lowlands of Egypt, uh, both of which agree uh, with the three sources. Ali Ard Misr uh, appears in Ibn Battuta, and Asafil Ard Misr appears in the text of Al Makrizi. Now, here's my last one. This one, this one is simplified and it's very close to uh, what uh, Egyptian. Uh, call the uh, places today. Uh, it's simply there's the 
the traditional pharaonic division, you have higher and upper, uh, you have upper and lower Egypt, and it's sim simply uh, Mr. Egypt and uh, uh, Said, which is the Highland. Okay. Yeah, and both, both of these terms are still used in the modern uh, vernacular language. Mr. of course, is, uh, is an exonym. It's not the traditional uh, Egyptian name of Egypt, but it became now an homonym with the adoption of Arabic. Now that still there is no delta to be found in, uh, in maps. And this is simply because it's a modern uh, introduction. This is the earliest uh, attestation of the word delta used in Arabic that I could trace. It's from a uh, uh, Christian uh, writing on the history of sacred wars in the East called uh, the Crusade by the patriarch in the East, Maximus the Third Muslim. And he writes, and thus it was called a delta because it has three angles, like this uh, delta. Like the shape of delta, which is one of the letters of the Greek alphabet, delta. All late 19th century sources in Arabic were the first to use the Greek terms, feel this need to over explain it. Uh, no doubt because it was new and Egyptians and Arabs are not used to it. And the term was popularized very fast due to uh, Western, mostly French education becoming fashionable. So there's this new colonial context. And now it, the, its use have become very common. So conclusion, uh, the uh, traditional uh, division uh, of the, the two Egypts is uh, continues uh, to the Arab period. And um, the term Delta is not, uh, is actually, is not a continuity from the Ptolemaic period. Uh, it is a very modern uh, reintroduction of the term into use uh, among Egyptians. Uh, thank you, and now back to you, Dr. Oh. Hello. Okay. So that that just uh, maybe it doesn't make your day, but it told him in my day when Anas shared the the um, his findings with me. Because um, do you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, yeah, because I actually asked on Facebook and all the Egyptian friends responded were like, no, everyone, it's Delta. It's not, the other one is like a scientific term. So I assume that's what it was, but not at all. So I, I, I think it's, it's extremely interesting to see this reintroduction through classical uh, education within a, a colonial context. So now second case, Aliskanderia, AKA um, Alexandria. Um, so, okay, so this is the topic, this is a part of the topic of my next book. Um, so once again, a synthesis. We know of two sites in, that are now in Alexandria that were occupied prior to the Macedonian conquest. So Pharos, which, is, which was the site of the, of the lighthouse, and Rakotis, which is um, <clears throat> roughly located where today's and in antiquity too was the, the Serapium. Um, so the occupation of, the, of these two sites prior to Alexander is attested by a growing number of evidence. So we had literary texts, literary mention. Um, we also have toponymy, which is what I'm going to focus on today, and a growing amount of uh, archaeological and geoarchaeological uh, evidence, which are also embedded within a, a context where we, we're realizing <clears throat> that the broader area was already very well settled several centuries um, before the Macedonian came. You can think of the sites of Tonisa, Cleon, Plentine, also Nelson Island, uh, and others upstream as well. So I'm not, I'm not going to go on and on about the evidence. I've, I've given another talk about that and I have also a paper on this. Um, if ever you're interested, I can send you uh, the paper and the students in my seminar will actually have to read it. They have no choice. Uh, but if you're interested and you're not in my seminar, just, just let me know. Um, now the Egyptians uh, called the site uh, Raked or Rakedet. 
Um, the earliest attestation is in Estella uh, that was found in Cairo, but that comes from Bhutto in the central delta. Uh, it is called the Satrap Stele. It, um, it dates from the, the reign of Ptolemy I. And in this, the hieroglyphic text, um, we read he, Ptolemy, established his residence on the shore of the Wajor of the Haunebu. So Wajor was the name of the Mediterranean in Egyptian. And the Haunebu is the name of the Greeks. Its previous name, the name of that place being Bakote. Okay, so here we have a clear mention of the previous uh, occupation of the site. Um, I, I will just mention another text here, uh, which is another text written by an author um, based in Egypt, uh, pseudo calisthenes who's often, you know, considered to be a bit over the top and unreliable. Uh, his narrative is very different than when we found in, for instance, Strabo, which is the canonical uh, story about the foundation and pre-foundation of Alexandria. Um, I, I just want to put it out there because I'm, I'm thinking more and more about how the Egyptianness of this literary product can also mean that we should look at it at it in a different way, and, and we should try to think more about how a text like this can bear testimony to oral histories. Okay, I have no answer yet, but I'm just throwing this at you right now. What I wanna highlight with this uh, name of Alexandria, this Egyptian name of the site, is that it never stopped being called this way. Throughout the Hellenistic and Roman period, Egyptians continue to call it Rakotis. We have a few instances of transliteration of the Greek Alexandria in uh, Egyptian script, but all the way, uh, even till after the Arab conquest, and as we'll expand on that, the Egyptians continued to use Rakotis and its variations. According to Egyptologist John Baines and A.K. Angshid, and later in two uh, different studies, uh, the, the origin of this toponym goes back to the New Kingdom, so mid second millennium uh, BC. So that would not be uh, a recent motivation with, in, in comparison with Alexander's reign. Now, what I find very interesting is that until now, absolutely no one has showed any interest in studying the toponymic attestations of Rakotis. God knows Egyptologists really like to pick a topic or a word and get all the attestation and then do a PhD on the, on the topic. Now this is Alexandria. I guess for Egyptologists, it's not as exciting as uh, other Theronic uh, royal capitals. Um, <clears throat> but given how famous and important uh, the city is uh, within, um, scholarship about the ancient Mediterranean, it is very surprising, or maybe not surprising, that it's not been of interest to anyone so far. And so what I want to say here is that this absence of interest, which goes in line with other absences of interest and silences with regards to evidence that pertain to pre-Hellenistic Alexandria, these silences, I think, bear meaning. I think we can consider them as, as evidence of something. There's been a bit of discussion on what Rakotis means, so on its etymology. Uh, you have a table here from, um, from Akez uh, Engshaden's 2016 article. So Ake proposes, I think, quite convincingly that the toponym meant the end of the habitation. So there is, you can see the last uh, this uh, this refers to a city, and this is a building, right? There's the, there's the idea of building something. So this is kind of there in all the proposals. Okay, consider comes to the conclusion that it means the end of the habitation, right? So that would be a, a kind of a practical denominations because north of that there's the sea, so you cannot really build much. Um, however. Uh, the, the question of erasure 
in the story related to this toponym uh, comes from historiography. And more particularly, uh, it is linked to uh, Michel Chauveau's seminal article um, that I'm, I'm quoting in the next slide that came out in 1999. So Michel Chauveau in this article, which is about Alexandria and the Egyptian point of view, um, goes against even classical writers and proposes basically that there was nothing in Alexandria before Alexandria and that the Egyptians did not even have a say in the choice of the toponym, but received it top down from the Macedonian rulers. So he writes, we cannot reasonably believe anymore that the term building yard could have designated a village that had preceded Alexandria. While such a toponymic formation is unheard of elsewhere in Egypt. Obviousness constrains one to consider this name to be a spontaneous designation, um, which goes again the studies from Bain and Engshaden, which were done later that I cited before. Uh, which corresponds to the real state of the city during the 10 or 15 first years following the 331 foundation, which was used by the Egyptian workers who had been requisitioned uh, to build the new capital. So for them, no doubt uh, from all over the Delta and the Memphite region, Alexandria being built could not be anything else but a building yard. In the meantime, Egyptians had had no other term to name Alexandria than that of building yard, which corresponds to the only material reality that was accessible to them, since they were not supposed to find their place in the future city. Established in his new residence, the satrap tried to have his indigenous subject, and here I should say indigène in French has a very um, particular connotation. It's really derogatory and quite colonial. Um, so the satrap tried to have his indigenous subjects accept their new capital by communicating a name formed on a traditional scheme that allowed to put forward the pharaonic status of Alexander, right? So Michel Chauveau is, is a demoticist. He actually taught me demotic and he's, I, I really uh, had a good time with him. The, the only year I tried to learn demotic. So this is not personal, uh, but I was quite kind of in shock when I read this. And it is really been cited over and over again uh, since then. But what you see happening here is a, a story that completely evacuates Egyptians' agency in giving a name to the site, that completely evacuates Egyptian presence and right to inhibit the site, that positions them as subaltern subject of a foreign power. And by doing that, you kind of take away the land, you de-Egyptianize the land, right? The land becomes the satraps land, the Greeks land. The Egyptians don't have their place there. We know very well that Alexandria had a lot of Egyptians in them. Uh, so there is really, a, there is a, a really a, an active erasure in that story, which it's all the more dissonant that, that by that time we had even more evidence as to the occupation of the area uh, before the Hellenistic period. And by occupation, we can talk about that in the Q&A, but there's also the whole question of what is considered a valuable or meaningful occupation of the land? Does it all, only have to be a city with monumental building? Why? Uh, so this is a whole uh, other story. Um, and now I will again pass the baton to Anas, who's going to talk about the uh, Arabic evidence. Oh, yeah. Okay. I got, got it. Uh, do you see the. Uh, excellent. Okay, let's start in that case. So when I started researching, uh, uh, like autism Arabic sources at the request of Dr. Abdua, I had only one clue. It's a linguistic one. The Arabic name Rakuda uh, seemed directly derived from Memphitic uh, Coptic Rakud without the mediation of Greek Rakutis. So from the start, I suspected some unmediated contact between uh, early Islamic sources and Coptic uh, culture. Now, 
when I dived into the text, I was surprised by actually how known Acrotis appears to be. Uh, most of uh, Arabic authors who wrote on the antiquity of Alexandria uh, have accounts of a pre-Alexandrian city called Akuda. Uh, there are eight of them. Ibn Abdul Hakam, the second one, is the only one who doesn't name it by name, but talk of the, the pre-Alexandrian city, maybe be because the word was uh, very known among uh, Coptic people. So he didn't feel the need to name it. Uh, so a uh, few remarks. Uh, some of them are minor authors, but half of them are uh, major authors. Uh, some of them are Egyptians, and many of them are uh, from across the uh, uh, Islamic uh, coining. So let's dive right in the text and see what they have to say, starting with Al Makrisi. So Al Makrisi writes. Uh, this city, Alexandria, is among the oldest in the world and among the oldest foundation. And it was built more than once. It was built for the first time after the unfolding of the deluge in the time of Mizraim, son of Besa, son of Noah. And it was called back then the city of Rakuda. And it was rebuilt after that twice. So if the city was built by biblical Mizraim, the legendary father of the Coptic people, that is basically saying that it was a uh, time immemorial. The author continues, in the time of the Greeks, Alexander, son of Philip, the Macedonian, renewed it, uh, talking of Rakuda, the one who beat Darius. And Alexandria was known from his name. Uh, so the name comes from the renewal, not from an, an ex nihilo foundation. Here's a second author. Alomari, who is also a major author, writes, Alexander added uh, uh, to its, in, its uh, construction, uh, meaning of Rakuda, Alexandria. He added to the height of its lighthouse. And yes, there are many authors, uh, Arabic authors, who talk of about a lighthouse before the Greek lighthouse, only that it was much smaller. The Greeks built a much, much bigger one on the top of it. And it was named Aliskenderia from that moment. And its name before that was Rakuda, and the Copt know it by uh, this name in their ancient books. Fact check, Alexander did not build the lighthouse. It was Ptolemy II. But for uh, Arab authors, if Greeks uh, did something, it's all on Alexander most of the time. That is mine. Okay. Now, do we have these Coptic books that Alomari speaks of? The answer is yes, only one of them at least in a very terrible shape. What I'm gonna show you is an English translation of an Ethiopian translation, I do not read this language, of an Arabic translation that is now lost, of a Greek or Coptic text that is now lost by John of Nicu, seventh century. And uh, what's important here is at the end, now its name formerly in Egyptian language was Acoustis. There's not, uh, it's difficult to, to work with this, especially without uh, knowing Ethiopian. So I won't uh, uh, comment more on that. And I will go directly to the conclusion. So account of the pre-Alexandrian Egyptian city called Rakuda are abundant in Egyptian and Arabic medieval sources. In fact, many Arab historians viewed Alexander not as the founder of Alexandria, but rather as the one who expanded it and renewed it. There's only one major uh, Islamic author who does not mention Rakuda, uh, it's At-Tabari. At-Tabari, uh, and the reason is At-Tabari is a Persian active in Iraq, and he's very learned in Greek or Roman sources. So he either viewed Coptic sources as less uh, good or he didn't access them or care about them. So it's the only author who gives the Greek or Roman myth of Alexander find the land empty and just does this uh, demiurgic act of give, giving birth to a city. The name Alexandria was given at the occasion of this renewing. Uh, this perception comes from an indigenous Egyptian memory that was pr preserved in Arabic sources and that have been up to now totally overlooked and dismissed. Uh, thank you and back to you, Catherine.
Jonas. Okay, we're getting to the conclusion. In case you're like in desperation. Conclusion. I'm gonna, I never do that, but I'm gonna read something. Um, okay. A toponym is a story. It is a story of the relations between human beings and the land that holds, nourishes, and sustains them. A toponym bears within itself the gaze and vulnerability of the beholder. Toponyms can be expressions of love and respect, propitiatory offerings, ownership and dominion, and markers of roots. By naming, one acknowledges the being of a place and their intimate, embodied, and experiential relations with it. So what stories do the toponyms use to designate the ancient to modern Alexandria and now Delta tell us? I want to highlight three entangled and at times overlapping stories. The first one is Egyptian. It is indigenous to Egypt. It goes back to the Pharaonic period. Tamahu and its Greek, Latin, Aramaic, and Arabic translations bring us into an immersive experience amidst the Nilotic landscape. Flowing water and moving silt flow down. They shape and reshape the land. The river is an agent, a subject. Flowing down, it reaches an apex. As it branches out, it slows down its pace, meanders more, and eventually reaches and morphs into marshes and lakes, where from it literally ends into the sea. In this place, the northern land is low. As for uh, Rakotis, and its Coptic and Arabic forms, well, they teach us about a long-standing and enduring relationship between Egyptian and the strip of land that sits between the Lake Mariotis and the Mediterranean Sea. There, the habitations literally ended, if my colleague Eke is, is right. There, the sea marked the end of uh, the Nile, whose um, westernmost branch uh, flew not too far away. The enduring use of Rakotis by Egyptian speakers after the Macedonian foundation of Alexandria and the mention of the toponym in uh, classical and Arabic sources tell us that the Egyptians did not see Alexandria as a name that fitted their relationship to the land, to the place. They did not because that place in their tongue already had a name. The fact that the neighborhood of Alexandria was called Rakotis can be seen uh, maybe as a sign of the awareness or containment by the Hellenized settlers and rulers of, um, of Egypt, of Egyptian claims of belonging to this land. The second story comes from the sea. It is younger and although favored by foreigners and absorbed into spoken Egyptian Arabic much later, its roots on local tongues are shallower. The story tells of how Ionian Greeks encompassing gaze traced and sailed the contours of the region. They, like so many Greek and Latin settlers, rulers, travelers, and speakers after them, approached the land from the sea. They knew and used the harbors located at the eastern and western edges of the Delta's coast. From there, they sailed upstream along the westernmost and easternmost branches of the Nile. To them, this place looked like a triangle. Its base is the sea. Its two sides are irregular fluvial channels that meet up south. It is literally a giant aqueous delta. The story also tells us of a of the conquest of a young Macedonian king and of the dynast who linked themselves to his legacy. It both inaugurates and commemorates the incorporation through conquest of Egypt into Hellenized and Roman empires. By founding the police of Alexandria on the spot of Rakotis, Alexander of Macedon capitalized on the already thriving connectivity networks the area was embedded in. One could also argue that paradoxically, perhaps, the latter, uh, the later emphasis on the dislocation of the city from Egypt uh, was an embodiment of the Hellenistic and Roman rulers' overall 
limited understanding of an imprint on the Egyptian land and its peoples. The third story is that of scholars, travelers and peoples educated in the Eurocentric tradition. It speaks of empire and civilization and classical genius and culture. It is, some might think, our story. The story tells us about whose voices we cherish and fetishize, what questions we do and do not ask, what type of evidence we look at or not, value or not, and why. The story also tells us that of the two stories um, I just mentioned, our woven understanding of Hellenistic and Roman Egypt as a space and as a place remains firmly tied to the second story, the Greek one. It is in a way a mirror. In many ways, our deciphering of the Delta and of Alexandria is one-eyed. Not that we don't have two eyes, but I suggest we tend to cover uh, one of them. It is there, but snuggled into a comfortable silence. This is why, for instance, we're easily able, even though we're not specializing on Egypt, to you know, locate ourselves and have some ideas of the ancient sites on this map. But what happens when we put the actual local names of these places on the map? We are not as literate, me included, and took me like an hour and a half doing this thing. I'm really not a cartographer. And what about this one? We're not literate in that, most of us, uh, either. Just like the renaming of Lac Pakitanica into Lac Blue Eye by Quebec settlers uh, state, Western historiographical failure to listen to what indigenous toponyms tell us about the history of Lower Egypt and Rakotis amounts, I suggest, to what uh, Anne Stoller calls occluded histories. Um, so she says in her brilliant book, Duress, to occlude is an act that hides and conceals creates blockage and closes off. Occlusion is neither an accidental byproduct of imperial formations, nor merely a missed opportunity rendered visible to a critical witness after the fact. They are not just neglected, overlooked, or forgotten. Occluded histories are part of what such geopolitical formations produce. So what are ways forward then? I suggest we start by following Sarah Ahmed's plea to refuse, quote, to cover over an absence when it comes to our current master narratives. Um, so as a starter, I would like to suggest some work that have been um, helping me uh, and kind of consciously and unconsciously reshaping the way I approach ancient um, material. And these are work uh, by indigenous scholars that pertain to, let's say, three main uh, themes. The first one is uh, decentering the human in beings. Um, if you haven't read Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass, I'm a huge fan. I think some of the students in my seminar are now fans as well, I won't speak for them. This is amazing. Uh, basically what happens when we, um, we look at the land and everything it encompasses as beings, and when we kind of decenter the human in history in a way, how can we look differently at our evidence and at dynamics? Uh, so this is an indigenous way to look at the world. Um, I'm very much uh, in the process of digesting this idea um, that everything we are is stories. Um, Thomas King wrote about that in The Truth About Stories. Um, and he's also putting forward uh, this important relationship of indigenous knowledge um, to orality and oratory, which I think were also very prominent in the ancient societies we're studying. So how can we trace back these um, oratories in the evidence we have? And so that's why I, I pointed to the case of pseudo-Calisthenes, for instance. Uh, Lee Maracol, who's at the UFT, 
uh, is another amazing author who also reflects on these questions. I particularly recommend in that regard or her, her, her book, uh, Memory Serves. And lastly, uh, the concept of Etuap Munk or two eyed seeing, uh, which was developed by Mi'kmaq elder Albert Marshall. Uh, is I think very interesting as well for us. And it's been kind of taken on by scholars, mostly in uh, science and education. So it's about trying to look at what you study and at the reality, both from using tools from uh, Western ways of knowing and indigenous ways of knowing. So in our case, it would be somehow epistemologies and indigenous contemporary epistemologies, but we could also think about ways in which we could try to be a bit more mindful of ancient ways of, of knowing, which I know a lot of you are already, but what happens when we incorporate um, Turtle Islanders traditional ways of knowing into, into our reflection. Uh, I will end with this. If you want to have more references, uh, there's a huge list of uh, publication in, in these uh, to post. And that's it for me. Thank you for listening. I know it was a long presentation. Thank you very much, Katrin. And with that, we uh, open the floor for uh, questioning. I will stop the recording. And of course, anybody who needs to leave, uh, feel free to just uh, uh, sign off. You don't have to feel awkward about that. Uh,